the first thing I want to talk about is, is the bench height. So I've always done um, hip thrusts off of a, with my back on a bench, but uh, some of the benches, uh, you know, I had a lower bench in, in my garage and it, it was very conducive to hip thrusts. And if you look at my first hip thrust video, the one that you know, has over 100,000 views and got really popular, my torso angle is, when my butt's on the ground, my torso angle is at around a 45 degree angle. But you see some of the bench heights are really high and you see some of the people's torso angles are almost vertical. That's, I don't like it going that deep. Um, some people can make their back feel weird. I prefer a lower bench height. And uh, I've been doing this for a while and I like using an aerobic step. Here I have two risers, um, but I like three risers, I like four risers, but in between that range. Um, so I feel the most glute activation when I go around this height. Three, three risers is probably my preference. And the next thing I want to talk about is back position. And uh, I just hook it. If I were to be doing single leg, you kind of hook in, this is exactly where I want it, right here. You don't, as you do the hip thrust, you don't want to be sliding backwards on it. You want to hinge from here. So I stick. If I choose right here, I come up and I stick. I hinge around that point. So you find a comfortable back position and that's where you stay. You don't want to slide up and down and glide over your hinging. Okay, now I'm going to talk about bar position. So <coughs> the way I get the bar into position, and this is possible because I use the larger plates. If, you don't, if you're not strong enough to use larger plates, you can't do this. But I just roll it over, you know, I put my legs under it and I roll it over. And I just get it right in my lower abdominal region. So this is right above my pubic bone. And then on here, it's touching my hip flexors. So I'm not resting on bone right now. When I come up, to here, I feel it touching lower abdomen, upper hip flexor musculature. Now some people aren't as lucky as me, they feel it on bone, maybe they're not as mus mu muscle or they're, they have different you know, pelvic anatomy, but if that's the case, you will benefit from using padding. There's two scenarios, one is the Hampton thick bar pad. See how thick the padding is here? This works well, and I train a bunch of girls right now. Some of them prefer the Hampton Thick Bar Pad, and some of them prefer the Eric's Balance Pad. Um, it just comes down to per personal preference. I like the Eric's Balance Pad because you can use it for more things. But with the Hampton Thick Bar Pad, you place it through, and then you want to make sure that when I roll it onto my hips, that this crease is facing upwards. Because if I, if I have the crease facing downwards, it'll come through this slit. And then it's resting on your, your body and you don't have the padding. So if you use the Hampton Thick Bar Pad, make sure when you get it into position, the slit is facing upwards. But when you use the Eric's Balance Pad, I just kind of go like this. And then, you know, roll it into place this way. And just like that. Okay. When you do get the bar into position, see my foot placement, I have a slight foot flare. Some people like their feet straight ahead, some people like more of a flare. Again, this is down to personal preference. I like a slight foot flare. And uh, you kind of, when you get into place, you kind of screw your body into place, get tight, you know. My back is secure, my feet are secure, I feel stable now. At this point, as I press up, my hands just go on top of the barbell to guide it and keep it into position. You don't want the bar rolling back or down during, this, during the rep. So it stays into position. So watch, watch the bar. Up top here, it stays right there. I don't let it roll back and I don't push it forward. It stays right here. The whole set. It doesn't move. One last thing, neck position. I don't think this is too important, but just try to keep your neck. I'm sure I flex a lot, but you know, you can, some people like to put their head back on the bench. I don't think this is that important. But try and keep it in neutral throughout this set. So, you know, 
And we tuck the chin. So as you come up, the, neck, the head and neck kind of travel with the body. Okay, the next thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, is spinal and, and pelvic um, motion uh, when, when you do this exercise. So, uh, this is the main compensation pattern. The, the main way that people screw up a hip thrust, and the hip thrust can be dangerous, just like any other exercise can be dangerous. If you deadlift with a, a rounded back in lumbar flexion, you will eventually hurt your low back. If you hip thrust with a hyperextended position over and over repeatedly for many years, you will probably hurt your back. And so you want to avoid that. Well, here's an easy way to tell. So you want the motion revolving around the hip joint, right through here. And you want this to stay straight. Well, when you watch people do hip thrust the wrong way, they will you watch their chest come up. You see this towards the end of a set a lot of times. And you have to get people to build up the discipline to keep their, their, their torso you know, uh, in neutral while they use the glutes to push their hips up. So if you watch here, here I will do it the correct way. Watch my torso. All the motion occurs through the hip joint. If I hyperextend my lumbar spine, you will see, this is what you'll see. See that? Do you see this arch? Okay. So if they do it the right way, this stays in neutral. Now what about the pelvis? So if you come up and I'm, see this? This is pelvic posture tilt, inter tilt, posture tilt, inter tilt. And the pelvis and the spine work together. Um, that's why they call it, uh, and the hips too, they call it the lumbopelvic hip complex. So if I let the spine go into anterior pelvic tilt, I'm probably going to hyperextend my lumbar spine. So you want to use the glutes as not only hip extensors, but posterior pelvic tilters, or probably more accurately, anti-anterior pelvic tilters. What I mean is, you don't let the pelvis go into anterior tilt. So, as I come up, this is anterior tilt, posterior tilt. Anterior tilt, posterior tilt. So, see this motion? This is pelvic motion. I know it kind of looks funny, but <laughs> the body under load wants to do this. You're using your glutes to prevent that from happening. So, if you just push through the hips, and focus on not allowing that, okay? You won't be able to come up quite as high because posture tilt actually mimics hip extension. Um, so you have two choices here. Push the glutes up really high into hip hyperextension or kind of posture tilt as you come up and you won't be able to come up quite as high. Either way I think is equally as valid um, but the posture pelvic tilt option really prevents that lumbar spine from hyperextending. And I've had a couple clients um, over the last year who initially they said, Brett, I feel this in my low back. I said, try it this way with the posture pelvic tilt. It's just slight posture pelvic tilt. They have never had a problem with hip thrust ever since. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is, um, is fluidity. Fluidity and full range of motion. So, I watched these videos of people doing hip thrusts on the internet. Some of them are really done well and some of them are poorly. If you watch someone and they're like this. That's um, just as bad as a quarter squat or a, you know, a crappy round back deadlift. You want to make sure the hips are controlling the range of motion. It needs to look fluid. And this is just something you get an eye for. So watch this. See how fluid this looks? And I use a full range of motion. There's no partial reps. So. Here's what it looks like. I'll do three reps. That was fluid the whole time. I can be explosive, but my glutes feel it up top. I don't let tension off. That's the most important thing. Get people doing it fluidly throughout the whole range, and don't let them go too heavy to where they can't do that. And then build them up slowly and gradually over time so they don't start cheating. 
Make sure you always re uh, achieve a full range of motion. All right, now I'm going to go over the seven different types of barbell hip thrust variations. The first one I just call the barbell glute bridge because you're not elevating anything. The barbell glute bridge, I am just going to keep my shoulders right here on the ground. I'll just do it like this. Um, my only problem with the barbell glute bridge is that if I do it on you know, some rubber flooring, I stick. But if the, if the flooring is, you know, is uh, like wood or tile or something, you slide all around. So it really helps to do it on a, a, a surface with a lot of friction. Otherwise, I try and have some, someone stand, you know, facing um, backwards or something, and I put my shoulders up against their, the back of their legs, and that prevents me from sliding backwards. Um, I like the barbell glute bridge. It's less range of motion, but you can use heavier loads. So quid pro quo there. Okay, the next variation is just the regular hip thrust. And again, you can elevate this however you want, but the regular hip thrust is with my, my back right here. And this is the traditional hip thrust, just like that. And my, my shoulders hinge. The next variation I call the American hip thrust, but I actually, I had never thought of this until I saw Timothy Ferris uh, came up with it. And he was doing hip thrusts like this with his, with his back way up on here. And you just go like this. And I don't know why I don't do more of this American hip thrust because I actually think it works more glute. And I think if I were to test the glute activation, I would show higher, higher, higher um, EMG with the American hip thrust. You can also use heavier loads. In fact, you know, I can do, you know, 500 pounds for like eight reps this way. And when I finish, my glutes are so pumped, you know, I, I have a hard time walking correctly. So don't uh, underestimate the American hip thrust. The difference is just where my, where the, my back is hinging against the uh, bench. So I like it because you can also kind of place your elbows right here. See my elbows stay on top of the bench, and you just kind of from here just. So that's the American hip thrust. Very good variation that you should do from time to time. Lets you go a little bit heavier too. All right, now the next variations are just variations with the way you do your set. And one of them is the rest pause. The rest pause I'm going to do with heavy weight. Say I've got, you know, 450 pounds on the bar, and I can do it for like five reps. Well, I will do my five, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and then I'm gonna rest like it doesn't matter, there's no rules set in stone, but I'll rest 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, do another rep. Okay? Rest 10 more seconds, do another rep. Okay? This is a, a way to extend the set. And I like to think it works more on the neural side of the, neur the neuromuscular system, but maybe I'm just making that up. But anyway, it's, a, it's an advanced method that lets you extend the set and lets you get more repetitions with heavy, heavy weight. All right, the next method is the constant tension method. With the constant tension method, I like to load the plates up, um, with, with females especially, with uh, like 25-pound plates because you can see this is actually a 100-pound plate right here, but... Um, See how there's tension down low because the bar is maintaining contact. So I have tension all the way at the bottom, but with some women, they don't have tension. You want tension throughout the whole range, and I don't even, even let them touch. They just kind of, I'll put the bar in their lap up top, and you just pump them out like a piston. So with the constant tension, it's just kind of like this. You'll just go... just focused on, just think of a piston going up, down, up, down, up, down. And uh, this gets an incredible burn. When I do the constant tension method, I only use 225 pounds for 20 reps, and it kills me. All right, the next method is the pause method. And with the pause method, I just do a three-second pause up top. And uh, this is, provides a really unique stimulus. It really burns. Uh, my female clients really love this method is uh, just for variety. 
anxiety. But all you do here is count to three seconds up top. If you tell people on their own, count to three seconds up top, they really do one second. But you're going to really hold it three seconds. So, come up. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, I've found that you can usually get about 10 reps with what you can normally do for about 30 reps that way. And uh, then the last method I want to show you is the ISO hold method. And uh, this, you just come up to the top, hold it for time. Lock yourself in right here. Don't let your spine move into hyperextension. Squeeze the glutes the whole way, and you just hold it. And, you know, I've done like 405 for, I think, 25 or 30 seconds that way, and it is brutal. So anyway, those are the seven different ways of doing bilateral barbell hip thrust variations.